Okay, welcome everyone. Today's conversation is about the countdown to AI. And we will look at where we are with artificial intelligence, what it looks like to get AI right, as well as some of the key risks and concerns. And to do this, I am joined today by Michael Kanan. Hi, Mike. It's good to be with you, Bernard. Yeah, no, it's so nice to have you here. Yeah, so you you are the author of the book T minus AI, Humanity's Countdown to Artificial Intelligence and the New Pursuit of Global Power, which was endorsed by some very amazing people: Eric Schmidt from Google, Adam Grant, Nobel Prize, Prize uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner Mohammed Yunus, Astronomer Royal Mark Martin Rees, and many others. And you've been the the chairperson of artificial intelligence for the U.S. Air Force headquarters at the Pentagon. And in that role, um, you, you've discussed AI in so many different aspects. And you have authored and guided the research and development and implementation strategies for AI technology and machine learning activities across the global operations of the Air Force. So this is pretty cool stuff. And you're currently now the director of operations for the Air Force and MIT initiative on, on, on this artificial intelligence accelerator. You've been named uh, by Forbes in 1919 as one of the the Forbes 30 under 30s and you um, you are on the Fast Company Impact Council and you receive the government's uh, Arthur S. Fleming Award that you share with amazing people like Neil Armstrong and Robert Gates and Elizabeth Doyle. So, Doyle, so, so nice to have you here. Um, <laughs> This this sounds super impressive. So maybe in your own words, you can tell us a little bit about your background and um, what you do today. Yeah, and uh, I, I again just want to start with I really appreciate the opportunity and appreciate everyone here right now. Not only your likely work on this topic, but your care and just being here today. So I'll start with a story because I think storytelling is how we humans learn best. And furthermore, for us. I really hope we can bring some inspiration and understanding on the topic to people, our colleagues, our families, and our friends and neighbors who might not naturally think about artificial intelligence if they aren't exposed in individually meaningful ways to them. Education on the topic outside of the traditional visions of engineering are really important. And each of our stories on being inspired to learn AI and to lead AI is going to be totally different. Mine began after graduating intelligence school, uh, after graduation from the Air Force Academy. And my first assignment was at this place called the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. And regardless of where you are throughout the globe, I have no doubt uh, you've personally gleaned some benefit from it at some point of your life, whether you know it or not. And arriving there, my first job was commanding a new mission. It was called ACES High. And in the military and Government, we all like acronyms regardless of where you are. The acronym is the Airborne Queuing and Exploitation System Hyperspectral. It was a first of its kind, and we were just a couple months from flying our first missions in the Middle East. That was daytime for us, or daytime in the Middle East, nighttime for us back in the United States. So the question is, well, what the heck is the hyperspectral sensor? So it's a camera that works much like our eyes do except better. You and I see in three color bands. A mantis shrimp sees in 12. One may philosophically ask, well, what does a mantis shrimp see that we can't? But a hyperspectral imager sees in hundreds. What does that mean? Well, in nerd speak, it can measure the radiance from reflected sunlight off of a material on the ground. And then we look across those color bands and we can identify certain materials that are spectrally significant in which the spectrum collects. Anyways, long story short, it was this that led to my initial passion for AI because I forgot to say the year. It was 2011. What was happening then? ImageNet, which for those maybe not um, tracking on that, it was a computer vision competition per se in 2011 when essentially the machine finally outperformed some really high human benchmarks in image recognition. We put a lot of pictures of cats into a database and saw what the computer could do. 
And as long as we ourselves don't keep kicking the can down the proverbial road of AI, AI came out of its last winter about that time frame, uh, at least machine learning in particular. So when you think about what we were doing, we were using, we were on this mission, we were using the sensor, we were collecting a massive amount of data, and we had to send that back to the United States via satellite data to be processed, all while flying, um, with only you know 15 of us sitting there, flying the plane, moving the sensor, and doing all the analysis to, at a moment's notice, let a sailor, soldier, airman, marine, a, a coalition partner on the ground know, hey, there's something you need to be concerned about. And sometimes that was literally turns away seconds, minutes from something like a convoy on the road. Because we could defini definitively detect and see what the human eye couldn't, such as bad materials that could compromise humans and convoys. This was a big deal. And for those of us who knew how to frame an AI problem, it was perfect. Mm. And that began a groundswell focus on AI about that time frame because I wasn't the only one wondering, well, how much more could we have seen? How much quicker could we have told someone? How could we have done better? How could we have better helped? Who could, how could we make smarter, righter choices? And that's the perfect AI problem. And even without it, the men and women of that mission took 37 tons of weaponized material off the battlefield, where by the way, just 50 pounds of it can take lives or damage vehicles. And it was directly cited and recognized as saving thousands of lives at very timely and critical points of discovery. And for relative context, this past summer, uh, there are 3,500 total deaths in the Middle East and Afghanistan. So despite any subsequent professional accolade or even recent personal accomplishment, it's the women and men on that mission that I'm always gonna be most proud of. And that's my AI story. And then from there, moved on to the Pentagon and kept the journey going with our data-centric modeling approaches. And how can we just, at the end of the day, make smarter, better choices um, in, in the right manner? And now transparently, as it should be, here at MIT, directing our new partnership um, developing AI publicly and for a public good. Very good. I'm so looking forward to our discussion. I just want to acknowledge a few people saying hello here. We've got people joining us from all over the world. We have people joining us from Hector from Mexico. We've got Sepnam from Istanbul in Turkey. We've got someone from Nairobi from Bangladesh. Philip from Sweden. Clyde from Cornwall in the UK. Uh, Jamal from Morocco, Sami from Lebanon, uh, I've got people from South Africa, from uh, Anita from Dallas and Texas, um, um, we've got Nancy from New Jersey in the US, from India, from Dallas, someone else from Cyprus. So it's really good to see everyone saying hello, keep this going. And also if you have any specific questions for any of us and Michael in particular, feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, anything that people might not know about you, Mike, that they might not find on your normal bio on your LinkedIn profile that you might want to share? Mm, this is a good question. Uh, every platform is different. We're different people on different platforms. Um, but I'm a really passionate music fan. And I mean to the extent that if I look a few rooms over from where I am now, there's a Riga turntable, original 1962 Dynaco tube amps, a uh, Hafler preamp, and some ELAC speakers. And for those who are kind of audiophiles, you know exactly what I just said. It's the opposite and completely analog setup that I too also so enjoy outside of all these digital things. And as a music fan, perhaps a timely and recent <laughs> announcement of Daft Punk breaking up after 25 years or so together. Um, in fact, the way they announced it was the other night and it was with a video titled Epilogue on YouTube. So the other evening I hop on, I see this video pop up on kind of, you know, the alerts and I say to myself, oh, heck yeah, a new Daft Punk album announcement. Then about halfway through it dawned on me what was going on. It was they themselves <laughs> announcing their breakup, which I say facetiously was harder to watch than, uh, than writing the last chapter epilogue of my own book. <laughs> um, but let's make it about AI for a second because I think this is fun. Their last album, R Random Access Memories, which is a masterpiece, RAM stands for Random Access Memory. 
And it's one part of the total memory that exists in a computer. And just as with humans, at the core of all computers is their memory. And without it, there can't be AI or machine learning because it's where information or data uh, is stored that's roughly equivalent to the brain's short-term working memory. But it's not really where the story stops with them. Daft Punk often spoke about AI. The second song on that album was called Game of Love, and it was using vocoders, in their own words, to elicit an emotion of something that's not human but tries to be. And other songs are written in the inspiration of Theater 4000 or Taking Space Flight. But really what it all is, is a really elegant showcase of human to machine teaming concepts, a concert of mind and machine. And what makes humans special? It's not fire, it's not tools, it's that we're capable of creating the artificial, the things that wouldn't exist in nature if it was just left to its own device. It's like aspirin. Um, but I think that it's, it's useful to point out this fact that this blend of art and technology can come together and the future rock stars are not just engineers who can code, they're philosophers and ethicists and teachers and artists and parents, um, but you might not know I'm a music fan uh, if you don't follow me on Twitter, but only LinkedIn. Very good. No, I, I love that. And this is an area I'm hugely passionate about, this whole idea that actually combining the best of the human, the best of AI can actually make us more creative and, and push boundaries that we, we never knew existed before. Um, you've just published your new book, uh, T-Minus AI. So why did you write a book and why did you write this one? Well, I think to set a baseline is the recognition that artificial intelligence is the greatest and newly developing technology capable of profounding, enhancing human opportunity and experience. But it also presents a fundamental threat to the safety and security of humankind. Mm -hmm. And although now it's commonly employed as one of the most foundational software and applications or products and services throughout everyday life to the most sophisticated of businesses and geopolitical pursuits, it remains entirely misunderstood by common citizens the world over. And then worse in recent critical years, AI has been relatively ignored by democratic policymakers, while China and Russia and other opportunistic countries have implemented its power to advance their international agendas and global disinformation campaigns. So most simply stated, AI is designed to capture and analyze and then optimize human patterns and practices without uh, without any overall guidance from us. But without the care and control, it can unintentionally or purposefully infiltrate our privacies and even replicate or exasperate our worst inequities, biases, and abuses. So unlike other existing AI books, T-minus AI was meant to be neither an excited portrait of a utopian future, nor a dystopian sketch of all we should fear. It was undertaken to objectively address the current re current realities of AI, the future implications. And my purpose was to explain the rudiments of the technology in a really accessible and engaging narrative mm -hmm. and to provoke a call that AI should be only implemented in ways with that are consistent with fundamental human dignities and for purposes only consistent with democratic ideals, liberties, and laws. And it's a technology that's uniquely poised to advance the efficiencies and ultimate purposes of private and public entities. The technology, though, is equally capable of compromising logistics and legitimate end goals of individuals all the way through institutions. Either way, AI is, you know, executes by assessing the patterns and predictions of biases in humankind, then bettering itself technologically to reactively alter and enhance that analysis and prediction. Now, the challenge though in writing that, with that in mind, is that you have to excise your own patterns of biases mm. from the narrative to create a work that would be lasting and equally accessible and fair to a broad audience of readers from different cultures, countries, educational backgrounds, social perspectives and political persuasions. So because the human experience is based on, you know, uh, how we ourselves interact and AI like electricity will much affect us in that way. 
and then further uh, kind of exasperate all those things. The story of AI from its origins to its present and future iterations is the story of humanity itself. So therefore, I wanted to write those as poignant themes that other books didn't do that I always wish I could have read. Very good. I, I think last time we spoke, you also said that you wanted to write a book that you always wanted to read. And I, I think I have to say to anyone listening, uh, this is a great book to read. It gives you a really good overview of AI and some of the challenges and some of the things we'll be talking about. So I really encourage anyone to read it. It's, it's a great read. And and this is this is the same purpose why I, I write my books, because I, I look into the market and think, okay, we're what do I really want to read about, know about, explore more? And then if that, it doesn't exist, then you, you write it. Mm -hmm. So um, how should we look at AI then? You've, you've painted the, the framework for AI, but how should it be used? And, and have you got some, some good practical ways of AI and how it is really beneficial? Yeah. How about, you know, we start with how we maybe shouldn't look at it. Mm -hmm. and then get to how we should look at it. Um, I know we shouldn't anthropomorphize it to keep imbuing these human qualities upon it. It's not us and it won't be. Mm -hmm. Despite how much I know people want to discuss the potentiality of artificial general intelligence, at least under any current or foreseeable technology, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. To the level set and, and to level set for everyone, when I mean I say artificial general intelligence, I mean an AI that could operate beyond a single domain of information or task orientation and then could perform successfully at any intellectual task just as humans do. So we've been saying artificial general intelligence and many of the conversations naturally kind of want to go to that place. And it, and, it, and it takes away from what's here and now. And we say it's right around the corner for many decades. But also the more we've accomplished in the science of AI, which is why it's so multidisciplinary, the more we've come to appreciate the deepest mysteries of the human brain, the more we've realized just how hard it would be for a machine to become capable of achieving anything other than specific oriented tasks. And that's beautiful. It can inspire so much. Humans might not be have the pro be able to process data as fast or as comprehensively as computers, but we think abstractly. We think across purposes, and we can plan and sometimes intuit and imagine the experience for solutions and and other people's problems without necessarily analyzing detail. Mm. And we call this common sense, right? Which is simply something computers don't have. And again, for this foreseeable future. AI will not be able to do that or solve something from something that's not there for itself, from data it doesn't specifically have. It doesn't have an intuitive sense. And for now, machine learning is a major driver, but it's not the answer to all things either, right? So it's not going to get us to this end state. And that's not to say, I want to be clear unequivocally, that something like a super intelligence or a general intelligence won't ever occur. But it would require a new breakthrough and approach, um, such as, you know, whatever that looks like. I don't know. And I understand that conversation. In fact, I have people I'm friends with and deeply admire who are focused on existential risk. It's important. But let's make sure that we know when we're having that conversation and when we're having the conversation that we need to have today. Because while there is time and space for speculative conversation, with what's currently transpiring in machine learning applications is it's abundantly clear that narrow AI presents enough actual and immediate concerns to warrant our full attention. And I don't want us to deflect our focus or misdirect attention because there are real matters to address. And just for myself, when there's a fire at the front door, I'm not always speculating about the lightning in the distance. So the question is, you know, how do we think about AI? Here's what I think. Regardless of whatever technique comes to be, regardless of um, whether you're talking about symbolic AI or machine learning or something else, it's a discipline that, that's designed to analyze data and formulate predictions without any overall guidance. That's it. That's all it's going to be. 
but definitions also only do so much. So how to think about it. I think in a beneficial way to humanity, to business now, is to think of it like this. AI is a flashlight, it's a mirror, or your canary in the coal mine. It illuminates otherwise ignored or undiscovered latent patterns memorialized in the world around us, which helps us strategize by just asking better questions. And if we think of it that way, we're not so afraid of bias, or we're not so afraid of, of, of what that prediction looks like, because what we're using it for is to strategize and think of new questions to ask. And I think that's a uh, much more practicable approach of how to think about it, um, regardless of, of, of the lane you're looking in, whether it's in home or professionally. So what are some of, some of the practical ways AI is used today to really benefit us? What are some of your, your favorite examples yeah. when, you dis, when you explain to people what AI is and how prevalent it already is in, in our everyday life? Interestingly, there's so many ways that we don't recognize, or even worse, once we recognize that they exist, we just take them for granted. Mm -hmm. And then, as I mentioned, say, well, that's not real AI, right? Um, interestingly, every time an advancement happens, it seems within the year when people use it, they end up saying, you know, well, that's not real, or I don't like it, or it hasn't advanced in the way that I like, and we live in the trough of disillusionment uh, once again. So let's start with something I think that could be quite powerful for just people listening. Call up a friend, search a term together on Google, then talk about the results. What you'll see in all likelihood, assuming you're not searching something already bought or paid for in typical results, right? The feed, not just Facebook feed, this is beyond that, right? Google search might lead to some different answers and maybe not different answers, but different resources mm. making you have different answers. I think that's quite powerful that when you realize, wow, my Google search is not your Google search necessarily. And then furthermore, you know, I, I also believe that the whole world talks about AI or whatever we're interested, whether that's people on the line who are interested in health, whether they're interested in business or marketing, they think all of their LinkedIn is interested in that. Well, no, it's machine learning applications ensuring that you're getting the right recommendations. So there's an example that it's in your life, but one classic example is spam filters. Mm -hmm. We once had simple rules-based filters to you know, filter out messages like Nigerian prints you know, that come from un unknown sources. Um, but they ended up not being effective against spam because spammers could figure out how to work around them just mm -hmm. as humans innovate. So they have to continuously learn from a variety of different signals, such as words or message metadata, uh, where it's sent, who it's sent to. Um, and furthermore, you know, you want to personalize your own definition of what constitutes a spam, which we also use now all the time. That's a feature that was provided. So, you know, now it's effective because of machine learning applications. 99.9% .9 of spam you never see. That's, you know, that's in your life. But to take it steps further, Back to music, the Spotify recommender system is incredibly performant and effective, albeit it's fairly basic machine learning application. But of course, how your bank or credit company detects fraud. Or Bernard, you're in uh, London right now, the London syndicate of underwriters and insurers. They use it to, you know, uh, to be able to predict and measure what they should or shouldn't insure against. So there's these common things that are all around us. And I think we're mostly better off for them. Um, but for those listening to this, the question I think too is, how can we frame it for our workforce? Think about it for us to ensure we're using it to the best of our abilities too, to better our lives. No matter what career or business you're in, there's an appropriate place for AI. So I'm often asked, well, what makes a good AI problem? And I guess tapping my inner Tom Petty here, the framing is the hardest part. So first, I think despite what one may intuitively think, AI is not going to replace people, especially the worker bees. Automation will. AI will actually have the greatest impact for you with subject matter experts or what you might deem you know, pejoratively as the top of the workforce. As leaders, when we're framing an AI problem, we want to look for three criteria. 
We want high volumes of data. So think of a ton of Excel files. We want high velocity of data. So think of the requirement that decisions be made quickly. And the last piece is highly accurate data. And this is a twist that I don't think we're talking about enough. The third criterion is where most people are failing. What we generally do is just espouse some notion that AI will be the advantage in some domain, such as, you know, if we have AI on this, we will surely beat our competition. And that's wrong. In order for AI to be effective, you want to provide it many examples of what you do. That's the secret sauce. Because again, AI is about illuminating new insights that you couldn't have had before and by asking new questions. And it does bring me to an interesting point too on this. When we're organizations and people thinking about our strategies and what we should do and how we bring AI to bear, you know, we're in the digital age and tech is profoundly cool, but whether you're in the private or public sector, just a capability is not your strategy, right? It's, you know, there's a number of strategies that I hear that they just say, well, we have a data problem. We need AI to make decisions and quickly. Let's do AI. We'll definitely win. And I think that's lazy and a little bit dangerous. It's a tool, an extremely powerful one that has immense implications, but it's a crucial arrow just in your quiver, your strategy quiver. The takeaway for us is that as a business, um, as entities, you don't win because of AI, but you'll lose without it. And the first part is just understanding it. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Mm. Let's make sure that we can communicate with people about what we're talking about. Very good. So we're, we're talking about AI. So what do you see as the, the current state of AI? And what are some of the things that excite you and what you see on the horizon that really that might push this? Because I remember when we talked last time, you, you said that even if there were no if there were no other advances in AI, AI would fundamentally change the lives of all of us and, and our business. Mm -hmm. So where are we today? What's what what's exciting and what's on the horizon? Have you uh have you ever had the opportunity to hear about the OODA loop? No. Okay. Uh, this is very cool. The OODA loop is a concept that was actually created uh, uh, in the Air Force by a guy named Colonel John Boyd uh, back in sometime in, I want to say, the 80s. And uh, it was interesting. I walked into a, a partner's, one of our venture capital firm partners, and they said, you know, what, you want, have you heard of the OODA loop? I'm like, well, yeah, I'm in the Air Force. But what the OODA loop is, is it is an acronym, because we love those. And it stands for observe, orient, decide, act. So in business, anyone who can do those things, and it's in a circular circle, if you can do all those things or drive down the time on one and tighten your OODA loop or you know, shrink the time radius, then you're going to do business faster. It's a good way of, of, of framing how to just think about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's effective, and I think it's right for the most part. When we talk about AI and the current state, I like using this as an example because AI is really, really good at the observe and orient parts of our businesses, right? So looking at data, being able to fashion ourselves towards new questions, holes that we have, biases we might not have seen, Etc., so that we can decide and act on new strategies to get out of the business of always observing and orienting ourselves. So, current state AI, if you can think of your business where you observe and orient yourself, right, for using those terms, that's a perfect place for machine learning. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Deciding and acting is where you want humans to be, you don't want them doing that stuff. So that's, that's one piece. And then I'd say the democratization of more of these technologies, advancements in compute are really interesting. Um, advancements in code with new languages, uh, in storage, and things that push more robust working applications into our hands and homes, I think is where things are going. Ones that used to require significant resources, 
you know, kind of like a graphical processor unit, GPU, Bitcoin mining type of resources. And I, I kid not that much at all, but, you know, significant enough that the average person didn't have those in their home unless they had a gaming computer or two. Um, so I think there's some really great capabilities coming our way. I mean, 5G will certainly enable some really impressive applications in our homes. And, and by the way, real 5G, not the commercials right now, right? That's not real 5G, they just call it 5G. Um, language transformers really excite me, uh, such as those from OpenAI, GPT-3, um, and now others in that business now too. Transformers are a really cool technology. So the horizon is a rise of dealing with what I think is, as I mentioned, that trough of disillusionment, getting it back into our hands because people don't think Alexa is good. Siri never listened. Um, but natural language processing, I think, will have its moment in the sun again after this kind of computer vision craze. Mm. New chipsets solely dedicated to specific AI tasks, mm. um, field programmable gate arrays, those are going to be a huge, huge uh, kind of boon. And interestingly, uh, AI engineers driving they themselves in some ways out of their own jobs with democratized AI platforms or do-it-yourself, lower no-code environments. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be huge. Um, so it, yeah, if I had to look on the horizon, I'm thinking about those things. And, and I think I'm thinking about um, advancements that are enabling us to use it more because again if you're not paying for it you're not the customer you're the product and they want these things in your home because they're going to make more performant things that make them better competitors and the virtuous cycle that occurs in business there which actually is a perfect link to another topic i want to discuss which is some of the the risks around ai um and mm -hmm. maybe some of the tough conversations that we should have um what do you see as some of the the biggest risks around ai and and what do you think are some of the tough questions that we really have to discuss that we might not discuss as regularly as we should um okay the tough conversations are the inherent duality to artificial intelligence. It's the toughest conversation mm. that people don't want to have. For instance, let's talk about where the advancements uh, in AI are happening, right? And they always tend to happen on games, but reinforcement learning and team play is kind of where the state of the art is going, where everyone's at, you know, reinforcement learning. By the way, it's one of the three basic machine learning kind of principles with supervised learning, unsupervised learning. And the difference with reinforcement learning is that um, when you're creating it, simply put, you don't need labels of inputs linked to outputs. It works to find balance by exploring environments. So that's how you saw it play games like Go, that's how you see it playing um, StarCraft right now, Dota 2. It's exploring different styles in games and then it's rewarded for just winning and then keep on exploring so we get all these new ideas. So the state of the art is happening there. What is StarCraft? StarCraft is a war game that we're publicly developing strategy agents and by we, I mean it esoterically, the world, right? Because we've looked at it as a do right for a public good, which is correct. That's what we need to do. But it's a strategy. It's a wargaming strategy game. It looks from the top down. It literally has the fog of war built into it. It has capabilities and you're trying to outmaneuver, compete over a, a, a plot of land, essentially. Well, let's name some places that's happening in the world, right? So, so we're essentially creating, and, and, that, and the world is far more complex than a game, but at least to the extent of maneuvering, that's a war game. Let's also talk about something we all talk about, deep fakes, mm. deeply, deeply disconcerting technology, especially as it advances. Well, hold on a second. That technique, deep fake technology, is the best technology that doctors use and outperforms doctors for detecting breast cancer and mammograms. So as we advance this medical, crucially important thing we have to do, again, observing and orienting AI, 
we're also advancing dual use. So the point that I'm trying to take away with this is that at the end of the day, as has always been the case, the narrow and specific purposes to which we ourselves put our machines is the principal problem and also the ultimate solution. Hmm. So when we talk about AI, it's like we, we throw the, not only the kitchen sink, but the whole kitchen out the window. When in reality, it's just how we use it. Hmm. Now, why is that a difficult conversation? Because the question is, well, who's using it and for what purposes? And I think that's a very hard conversation to have. Hmm. And, and, and while we'll make mistakes along the way, and that while you know, perhaps we won't um, always do good with it, I, I mean, we want to have that intent. I think what we need to do is make sure it reflects our values, hmm. which what does that mean? We have to get the whole world discussing the technology. So the biggest risks are the inherent duality to its public development that somebody else could use at risk to somebody else. And there's got to be some lines in the sand on those things. Um, and, and not sand, I mean, lines in the rock. So do you, do you have any examples of maybe where companies or where organizations have not got it right in the way they use AI? And I, um, I Yeah. 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 Uh, so let's call out the most specific ones using artificial intelligence, computer vision algorithms in particular to detect and identify Uyghur mm -hmm. uh, Chinese citizens and then detaining them. Let's go. The world should talk about that. Mm -hmm. That's not an appropriate use of artificial intelligence. Now, on the flip side, let's also talk about where we all also have concerns. Some might be concerned about, um, for instance, you know, let's talk about AI in the news. We had Amazon's artificial intelligence that essentially hired more people that look like you and I. That's wrong. We need to fix that. Mm -hmm. um, but here's the difference. They detected their bias and then stopped and did something about it. Mm -hmm. Did they intend necessarily to use AI to illuminate that bias? I don't know. But we can do that. And what, what was interesting is that when it happened, we and people said that's not right and then it changed yeah. right in addition think about microsoft's tay chatbot right <laughs> there's another instance of it happened it was held to account and we learned and changed hmm. you know that happens in some societies and in some societies that doesn't happen and i think that's where we need to have um the conversation about where we get it right and where we get it wrong Now, furthermore, artificial intelligence sits at the top of the stack, right? It's an application on top of your infrastructure and your software and, and your people and how you do business. So where do we get it right? Or where are we maybe getting it wrong? I'll tell you where. Not focusing on bridging the digital divide in this country and other countries. Mm. Whether you're in a rural community or an urban community, We mentioned how artificial intelligence works and artificial intelligence is not going to do anything outside of the data that it was presented. So if we have wide swaths of people who aren't represented in data, then they're going to be viewed as anomalies. These applications aren't going to recognize them. And that is a significant issue. So I think bridging the digital divide, and I give an example for those who are in the States right now. And I, I was a part of a, a hackathon a few weeks back, maybe a month ago, for the city of Detroit. In the city of Detroit, where I grew up, just for what it's worth, um, the city of Detroit, 40% of people don't have internet access. Wow. <laughs> it's, and, that's a, and that number extends across many urban areas, rural areas, you know, people on dial up and the rest. That's unacceptable. I think, I think so what we really are talking about is a contemporary education, bridging the digital divide, and then, and then of course, making sure that AI reflects our values. Mm -hmm. And in order to do so, we can't just have the engineers building it. Attorneys have to be involved. You as a worker need to be involved. What we should ask ourselves is when I use artificial intelligence, 
is its worldview, it being the machine, so worldview being data, is it fair and representative to its scope of reach, right? The number of people it affects. So I don't want an Alexa in my home only trained on Southern white gentlemen. And alternatively, I don't want it just trained on people from Northern California, right? It's in too many homes. Mm. We want it to be the best of what we are, who we are and represent it. So I think that's where um, we might be getting it wrong, but the difference is, is that we talk about it afterwards. Completely agree. I remember a conversation that we had where you talked about TikTok as well. Do you, do you have any views on that? Sure. Um, TikTok's a hard conversation too. So, so the whole world uses TikTok, right? Whether you're, you know, 31 or, or 14, TikTok's the thing. It brings a capability. It brings a smile into the home. So when, when you hear about these concerns that, well, maybe we should ban TikTok or, you know, TikTok has to sell to a different company. Let's, okay, so here's what we're talking about. When you're putting, what they're trying to say is, well, you know, for instance, for one, we're sending data back to China and they live in a world called, and, and let me be really, really specific here. When, and I think we all should. When we say China, we're saying Chinese Communist Party does bad with AI, not Chinese citizens, right? That, I, think that, I think that's a really important distinction with a difference. So anyways, we're talking about a technology that when you put that bunny face emoji on, like your face, it's computer vision algorithm, right? That's collecting. Mm -hmm. So you're using a platform to use AI, right? A form of it. That AI is now better because of it or more robust and performant. That algorithm goes back to a place where you don't live that views the world in a totally different way that uses more performant computer vision algorithms because it's training on more data to do things that probably aren't in line with how you view human dignity. That is, you know, that's true, but that's a really difficult conversation because it, you have to know so much about how AI is made and, and, and how it works and how that could even be a thing. So, so what does that mean? It means that we have to have more transparent open dialogues and contemporary education for students mm -hmm. and not just in STEM, but in STEAM with the arts, because the people who are going to write policies of, of whether that's good or bad and regulatory actions, those people are not engineers, mm -hmm. right? There are other kinds of people, they're writers. And, and I really think that's important. And TikTok is kind of a shining example of, of, of people wanting to have a difficult conversation but we're speaking above, below, and past one another all the time because we don't have a shared and equal amount of information and experiences. But it's very difficult to have that talk. Very good. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so we've talked about some of the the the, the negative negative sides, the risks, and, yeah. and some of the the ways it, it's gone wrong. Um, what are some of your favorite examples of AI, and and what does using AI well look like? Um, I think using AI well, there's a lot of jobs in the world that are tasks. I think it's a it's a wildly unfortunate and misuse of humans tasks. Right, whether that's on you know the assembly line or whether that's in their everyday business um, for the boss of you know writing that report from one computer to another, right? Stuff like that. When you think about your businesses or even your life, I am doing way too many computer things. That's a computer thing. Why am I doing this right now, right? And when you ask yourself that, that starts to look like the perfect place where you might say, okay. Let's memorialize that interaction. Let's use that data. And then let's, you know, use AI to get me out of that business. So I think what looks right from a very broad brush perspective is getting out of task oriented jobs, getting people to be more human. By the way, if an AI or automation rather, right, can replace a human, you weren't using them correctly anyways. 
So I think that that's, that's number one and a good way that we can as a society think about it and be really inspired to use the technology instead. Um, furthermore, I know that there's a concern about jobs, but if, if you and I, Bernard, were talking 12 years ago and I said AI ethicist, he said, no way, not a job. That's not a lucrative career field to go into, right? You would never tell your child to do that. And yet here we are, seems like a pretty cool career field to me right now, right? Mm -hmm. To help, whether you're at a law firm or whether you're at Google or wherever, to, to do something like that. So it's going to also create jobs. Or you know, 60 years ago, if we said graphic designer, computer engine, right? It, you know, this stuff wouldn't have been a conversation. So I think that that we should dispel that myth also. And doing AI looks like making jobs that had never existed before and also doing right by people who might be upended. So doing right for a world with AI right now also means tough conversations, for instance. I don't know, what, what tax software do you use over across the pond? When text. Like our, so we pay taxes when we owe uh, them yeah, yeah. through TurboTax. Yes, yeah. So you, you guys use the same you, thing? You've got zero, you've got... Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about it. Speaking of those jobs, once upon a time too, becoming a tax preparer <laughs> was like, I mean, that's an upper middle class job. An accountant, like that was a thing that you wanted to become. It was a great idea. And then in sweeps one software company and completely destroys that market. And we probably knew that was coming. I'm pretty sure people said, well, certainly. We're talking about jobs that might not exist in quite the same way right now. I think that instead of worrying about it the day that they get displaced, I think the next step is that we start um, um, building pathways forward before the displacement happens. I think people are doing that. You see the rise of, of a number of, you know, in particular one I'm very passionate about um, and, and, you know, being transparent, I sit on their board of advisors, the AI education project, which is helping see the world in this way uh, for K through 12 students. Um, so I think that doing AI well right now is that. It's getting rid of tasks of our lives and minutia, and then also using AI to expose biases. Don't use it, you know, a lot of people say, well, I can't use AI because that seems dangerous to, to make a decision off of because it's biased. I said, well, did you know you were biased? Use it to expose your biases. Don't make a choice off of it. Change your business off of it. Realize something you didn't know about yourself off of it. So that's where I think getting it right practically looks like for the time being. You know, of course, I'm also a fan of, you know, I, well, I mean, Uber drivers are really important, but, you know, of having a robot dog deliver me food. That, that sounds cool. You know, um, we, we are lucky enough to have that here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you see it launching, you know, more of that or, or, for instance, putting in a set of the ingredients in my refrigerator somewhere right now and then having it predict what food I could make, mm. you know, that, that looks like getting it right. So stuff like that. Mm. You, you mentioned an, an AI ethics person. Um, what do you see as some of the biggest ethical concerns when it comes to AI and how do we tackle them? I'm sure, mm. that, I mean, the, I know that the US government is, is looking for, for ethic, ethical people to look at AI um, and and I, I I'm sure that those are the conversations you yeah. must have had in the U.S. Air Force when you talk about the use of AI, the use of AI enables autonomous weapons oh. and other things. So what what do you what concerns have you got in terms of ethics and and how do we tackle them? Well, I, so ethics and its moral and appropriate use in line with uh, values, I think despite, you know, people's worst inclinations, what they want to believe, governments of the world, the UK, the US and France and 
Germany and Mexico. I mean, we, there are a lot of conversations of this and they are deeply ethical and the number of frameworks and guidelines in order to use something that could be deemed as unethical is, is vast. It's, it's certainly, you know, uh, uh, bigger than many private companies. I will actually kind of uh, rephrase. Yesterday, there was a Senate testimony in the United States with uh, Eric Schmidt, Brad Smith, and a uh, retired General uh, Hawk Carlisle, who sat in front of the, S the Senate Armed Services Committee, and they had this very conversation about what are we doing about the ethics? Where are we getting it right? It's open, you can you know Google it and look at the transcript or, or watch it. It was a really, um, I think, eye-opening uh, session and hearing. And you know, uh, Brad Smith had cited, he said, you know, we do ethics too. And when we have conversations with the Department of Defense or conversations with a foreign government, we learn something from them. They do a ton and we don't necessarily talk about that. So I think that, really important that there's a, that that's a, that's a realization I think we need to have and one we should celebrate and one we should hold people to account on. We're not always going to get it right. We being, you know, all people, all governments, um, but we should talk about that. The next piece is mm -hmm. when you say ethics, the first thing you should ask that person is, okay, so what part of the conversation do you want to have about ethics, whether it's right or wrong to use something, whether you're appropriately informed, to use that thing, whether the premise of the application or action is ethical, do you mean moral? And interestingly, so every ethics conversation jumps straight to bias, mm -hmm. but ethics is such a bigger conversation about than just bias. Um, so I really think that having really informed people and philosophers, I mean, and, and reading um, you know, Plato and Aristotle and the rest, I think is, is like crucial in these conversations. So the biggest ethical concerns for myself right now are twofold. Number one, are we having the right conversations? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I try, I think it's important to, to upfront say, well, which part of ethics are we talking about? The second is that how can we ensure, and I briefly mentioned this earlier, that, in, that some, some AIs or some recommender system or whatever the application of, of the AI is, that its worldview, again, data, data is akin to experience for a machine like us, that its worldview is fair and representative. And I think these are really key, key words, fair and representative of its scope. If we, when you start kind of plotting that out on an X and Y graph, you start to kind of see where things should be and where they shouldn't be. And what does that start to look like? It starts to look like regulatory actions, right? Say so if you're outside of this, that's bad. I love, I, I, I think that that just breaking it down simply like that. And then the other concern back to the point of how are we discussing it? When we say the words like explainability, it's anthropomorphized. What do you mean it's going to explain to me? I mean, you know, we, we, the, the, the most complex neural network in the world is our own brains. And if I, you know, asked you, Bernard, I said, you know, explain to me why you have a coffee mug because you got coffee earlier, right? So you have a mug near you. Okay, let's do an experiment. Bernard, how do you know that's a coffee mug? <laughs> If yeah, you thought about it, yeah. yeah, if you if you thought about it for a minute, you know, maybe five minutes, you'd eventually get to this point, you'd say, well, the first inclination is like, I don't know, because it's a coffee mug. Your second point would likely be, well, after 35 years of life, right? 35 years. <laughs> I gotcha. So <laughs> after 35 years, I've seen a lot of coffee mugs. I see what they do. I see what they're not. I see, you know, if you tip them over, they spill and that makes a mess on the carpet. That's all you would say, right? That would be the simplest explanation. Mm. If a computer could talk to you, it would literally say the same thing. So let's ensure that we're not, again, anthropomorphizing. I, I, you know, we talk about explainability. Well, do we mean robustness? You know, do we mean looking at the data set? Again, so 
equal conversations are my concerns just for the practical time being. Yeah. And then this is, this is a very good point. I, I think sometimes we hold AIs to almost a higher standard than, than ourselves, because you think, okay, if you have a, a panel of, of judges, they all bring their right. own biases. They don't understand how they're making decisions and how their tacit knowledge has evolved over the years. And, and we expect machines to do this differently. But I think there's also an opportunity that we can actually make some of those biased, mm -hmm. intrinsic decision-making processes that we have in our brains more explicit and actually say, it looks like you've based your decisions on this data. Did you want to do this? Was this right? And I think yeah. that to make it actually more transparent. Well, I, I, I completely agree with that. And interestingly enough, so the conversation, pun intended, can't be ones and zeros. It's not a binary one. Mm. right about this technology so there is a relatively you know some there are a number of voices in the ai world and some voices and and they all should be complementary but it's always interesting that you know for whatever reason those who look at the future don't like people in the present and the present people say well the future they're not mutually exclusive we got to do it all um but one of them that really kind of sunk down into just a binary decision is to your point they, you know, released a video of, you know, a missile launching, right? The thing that we're all concerned about. And then said, AI should never be on weapon systems. <laughs> you know, we got to have that talk, right? AI, I would also say, you know, I could easily say AI should never be in hiring actions. But again, maybe we can make smarter and more transparent choices than us as humans. We give ourselves so much credit, as you mentioned, and we're deeply flawed. So I think that that like broke it down into such a binary view of the world that I'm like, well, that's really unfortunate because there are plenty of examples in the world, for instance, you know, commercial airliners being shot down over very simple rules-based instructions by other countries and, and everyone, right? The world shouldn't be ones and zeros. If we can use AI to, again, observe and orient and then we ourselves decide and act, well, I, I think that's awesome. That's where we should want to go. Um, so uh, being willing to have the conversation, AI can help make us more transparent for tough conversations. So what do you think the role is for governments in, 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 in the whole space of AI? You, you talked about yeah. regulation. What, what, what do you see the role of government play in all of this? Um, a significant one. So um, those who say a representative government shouldn't use artificial intelligence, I don't get it. I just think that's so wrong. I, you know, a democratically representative government shouldn't use AI. That's, that, that's not advancing the conversation at all. That's just, you know, clickbait talking points. Because that representative government, their responsibility is to the people. So in some places, the view is sometimes that, for instance, commercial business should lead an AI. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. I want to celebrate immensely the work being done by, our, by commercial businesses around the world, the ethics boards that are standing up and all the rest. They are truly getting to a place where I think it's pal palatable that people are okay, that people can uh, do well by doing good. The only way to convince that though, is that through that whole fiduciary responsibility to a shareholder. Mm -hmm. That is literally how, you know, Western society and capitalism is founded, a fiduciary responsibility to a shareholder. Well, who's the shareholder of, you know, a government? It's not some group who can afford stock. It's, it's, it's representative of the people. Where mm. else should the AI conversation be? Now, I am not saying to use that for governments to limit commercial business. That's not what we're talking about here. But to set the lanes in the road, heck yeah. I think that's a really, really important conversation. And I think that's the role that governments have to play. And by the way, it inspires public service. 
it, it, public service is going to look totally different. The hardest conversations of our generation will happen by those in public service. Um, so I think that's a really cool place. And that's the role that they should play. This, this is why you work in that space. This is why I have not walked away from this space whatsoever. Very good. Very good. Um, so what are your future hopes and predictions for the field of AI? Um, I hope that we use AI um, as well as we can to ensure to the ability that we can that it's reflective of human dignity and only for the purposes associated with uh, uh, freedoms, liberties, and, and laws that are accepted. Um, broadly, or at least intended to be uh, fair to people. The hopes that I have are that th there's a, a dead set focus on it's not about us, right? You and, you and I, Bernard, you're never going to sing the tales of Ender's game about artificial intelligence, right? We're, we're not those people. Okay. We're creating a world for those people, for those future heroes and stories and the innovations and advancements that they ended up making and changing the world with this technology, which is possible now. So my future hopes are that this isn't about left or right, others versus others. This is just about ensuring that other people have the opportunities we don't necessarily have and the stories come from them. But I also would highlight that that means the onus is on all of us to talk about it in our homes, to read about it, um, just to take you know more than the bare minimum to have the 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 give a dang factor, right? Um, my future hopes are also that we know it when we see it, right? To, to use kind of a uh, a Justice Potter quote, I know it when I see it. That the world understands how this is working, um, like for you know. They walk to an elevator and it's just natural. Like, oh, the elevator's buttons aren't in the elevator anymore on this elevator. That means they took them out. So the optimization is happening between elevators on this computer that I'm clicking the button on, right? Like little things like that. I hope we inspire a world. So that's my hope. Um, the question is, is in practice. So I'm quite bullish on the future of AI. I'm not so bullish on, on if we're willing to have those conversations. And that doesn't mean we won't. It just means that it's on each of us to uh, help get us there. And um, and lastly, my predictions are the rise of natural language processing. Again, I put that on the year time frame. I think that we'll be really impressed with with what we have, um, especially with new language transformer models. And um, a prediction also is that is that if you're in the business of the social sciences and AI, you can do quite well for yourself. It's gonna be a lot of opportunities there. Very good, and I, I completely agree with you. Um, I'm just, anyone who wants to learn more, I've got your, your book here. Um, Thank you. Please read it. Um, and um, as always, let us know what you think. Um, we that has been such a fantastic discussion that we didn't really have a lot of time to answer many questions on air, but we will try to answer them off air um, and and get back to you. If you have any more questions or any comments, or you want to let us know what you thought about this session, I'm always keen to hear. Let us know, please, um, and engage. And if you ever want to re-watch any of these conversations, I have regular conversations with some of the, the brightest thought leaders in the space of future technology, then head to my YouTube channel where you can watch all of them or subscribe to my podcast where you can listen to them if you want to. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Mike. That was a, a real pleasure. Thank you so much. And to everyone here, thank you. Have a good one. Great. Thanks.